Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I'm here at my doctor's clinic and I'm here for my daily checkup. No, not daily checkup, my routine checkup. I'm healthy, trust me. Anyway, today I'm here at my doctor's clinic and we will see how a doctor's setup is like and what they do, you know? So we'll see if this checkup is scary or it can be the opposite. We'll find out today, so stay tuned. Oh wait, side note. I'm not gonna record the doctor, you know? It's not okay. Plus I'm going to have my checkup, so. But I will narrate everything to you, you know, afterwards, so don't worry. Okay? Stay with me. Hi, are you here for the checkup? Ah yes, I'm here for the checkup. Um, excuse me doc? Yes? Will this hurt? No, 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 it's not gonna hurt. I will only ask you a few questions and then I will proceed on to examine you. For that, I might or I will have to touch you. So if you only allow me, I will proceed on with the checkup then. It will help me if you explain everything to me, you know, the whole procedure before doing anything. Okay, no problem. Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Rabia and today we will be talking about the examination of extraoral tissues. What is extraoral tissues? Well, extraoral tissues are the structures that are present or situated outside the mouth. But before we dive into the main topic, we will briefly go over the components of history taking. There are eight components to history taking. The first one is the identifying the data. The data includes age, gender, occupation, marital status, and such, along with the sources of data, which are usually in the form of the patients. However, family member or friend, letter of referral, or clinical records can also be used as the source of data. The next is the reliability. This part reflects how the information, the quality of the information given by the patient, and varies according to patient's mood, memory, and trust. The third is the chief complaint. This documents the patient's one or more symptoms or concerns with which they seek help or care. Next is the present illness. This amplifies the chief complaint and describes how each component develops. It describes, it includes, documents patient's feelings and thoughts regarding the illness. It also documents medications, tobacco use, alcohol, and allergies. Next is the past history. It documents any childhood illnesses, any adult illnesses with dates for the events, and health practices such as immunizations. Next is family history. This should be confined with the blood-born relatives, such as siblings, parents, or grandparents. It documents the presence or absence of conditions such as hypertension or diabetes. Next is the personal and social history. This is in regards to the patient and it documents patient's educational level, lifestyle, current household, etc. And lastly, review of systems. This documents the uh, presence and absence of common symptom related to each of the major body systems. So now that we're done with the components of history briefly, we will dive into our main topic and that is the examination of the extraoral tissues. Extra examination is a subdivision of clinical examination. What is clinical examination you ask? Well, clinical examination is a process whereby the physician observes the patient and detects any abnormality. This is done so by asking question to the patient inspecting the patient and palpating the patient. Any abnormality due to disease, namely signs of disease, is detected in the clinical examination. Clinical examination has three divisions. The first one is the journal examination. In the journal examination, the patient is observed overall, that is the appearance, body and stature, temperature, pulse, etc. Second is the systemic examination. As the name suggests, 
it is the system-wise examination of the patient, that is, cardiovascular system examination, respiratory system examination, etc. And lastly is the local examination. The local examination is further divided into two subdivisions. First one is the extra oral examination, which is our main topic, and second is the intra oral examination. In the extra oral examination, structures such as jaws, muscles, lymph nodes, etc., are observed, while in the intra oral examination, structures such as teeth, tongue, soft tissues like gums, palate, etc., are observed. The examination has four steps. The first one is inspection. That is, you look at the patient. The second is palpation. That is, you touch the patient. Now, before this step, please take the consent of the patient. The third is the percussion. This is the gently tapping of the patient with your finger or instruments. Here, you will feel and listen to the differences. And last is auscultation. In this, you listen to the sounds, usually with a stethoscope. After taking the history, you would take the patient to the dental chair, make them sit in an upright position. Once the patient is seated, explain to the patient what you're going to do, that is explain the procedure to the patient, so that they're comfortable and are willing to participate. Once you're done with the history and you've taken the consent, you may start with the examination. A tip for you guys, start your examination from the top and then gradually go down, so that you do not miss out on examining any of the body systems. So in the extra oral examination, we will first start with the head and neck region. For that, you will stand in front of the patient and observe the patient. Firstly, you will look for a presence or absence of any asymmetry. Asymmetry can be caused by a number of reasons, such as developmental deformity, such as cleft lip or palate, inflammatory, such as TMJ, temporomandibular joint and kylosis, infectious such as Bell's palsy, neoplastic such as tumor in the head and neck region, or traumatic such as master hypertrophy, that is enlargement of the master muscle due to clenching or bruxism. Clenching is a process whereby the patient holds down their teeth tightly, while bruxism is the same as clenching, that is holding down the teeth tightly, but there is this thing. In bruxism, the patient, while holding down their teeth tightly, moves the jaws. Hence, bruxism is also called teeth grinding. While you're inspecting for the asymmetry, inspect the neck as well for any swellings present. Now comes the facial color. If the patient is pale in color, that means that suggests the patient might be anemic. Note for rashes as well, such as butterfly rash in lupus. Also note for arrhythmia, that is redness of the skin, which is usually an anxiety or alcoholism. You will also inspect the eyes. Check for the position and alignment of the eyes. Observe the eyelids and inspect the saclara and conjunctiva of each eye. Upon light, check the response of the pupil. Lastly, you will examine the ears the front of the ear, that is the preauricular area, and the back of the ear, that is the postauricular area. Once we are done with the inspection, we will move on to our next step of examination, and that is palpation. For that, you will move behind the patient, that is, you will stand behind the patient and palpate the patient using your fingers. Kindly note that the palpation should be gentle and not forceful as it may harm the patient. Firstly, we will start with the ears. We will palpate the ears, the front of the ear, that is the preauricular area, and the back of the ear, that is the postauricular area. We palpate these regions for the preauricular and postauricular lymph nodes. For this, you will use your finger and use a circular motion to palpate the both sides. Once you're done with the palpation of this area, you will move on to the mastoid process. Here, you will use circular motion and palpate this area. If there is pain on palpation, this may suggest that there is presence of ear infection. 
Once the ears have been palpated, we'll move on to our next area, that is the temporomandibular joint area. Place your fingers in front of the tragus and ask the patient to open the mouth. Your fingers will fall into a dip, which is the joint space. Once the location is known, ask the patient to open and close the mouth several times. This is done so know if there is any clicking sound present. Since clicking sounds are audible, stethoscope is not usually required. A click implies that there is disc displacement, which reduces to its normal position on opening. Crapticus, cracking or grating noise, implies a degenerative change or sometimes acute inflammation. Ask the patient to move the jaws laterally, that is from one side to another, and protrude the jaw, jaw, that is to move it forward, and listen for any abnormal sounds. Now face the patient and keep your fingers in front of the tragus. Ask the patient to open and close their mouth. While they're doing so, note if there's any deviation upon opening and closing. Now, you need to explain this to the patient. Tell them that you're going to open your mouth to the maximum. And after you've done that, you're going to use your three fingers, the index finger, the middle finger, and the ring finger. And you're going to put these three fingers between your upper central incisors and the lower central incisors. This will show the range of opening of the mouth. And the range is usually 35 to 40 millimeter. If there is limited mouth opening, Ask the patient whether it is due to pain or any other obstruction. Now that you're done with the examination of the TMJ, temporomandibular joint, we'll move on to the examination of the muscles. In this, we're going to examine the muscles of mastication and they are four. The first one is the temporalis muscle, second is the master muscle, third is the later pterygoid muscles, and lastly, medial pterygoid muscle. We will start with the temporalis muscle first. Before we do the examination, I want to tell you the attachment of the temporalis muscle. This muscle is a fan shaped which arises from the temporal fossa below the temporal line and inserts at the apex and medial surface of the coronoid process and the anterior border of the mandibular ramus. To palpate this muscle, ask the patient to clench their jaws and once they've done that, you palpate the muscle, you gently press the muscle against the skull and move in circular motion. Now we'll move on to the masseter muscle. Again, before the examination of the masseter muscle, we will study the attachment of the muscle. The masseter muscle consists of two layers, the superficial layer and the deep layer. The superficial layer arises from the maxillary process of the zygomatic bone and the anterior two thirds of the zygomatic arch. This layer, the superficial layer, attaches to the lateral surface of the angle of mandible and to the lower half of the mandibular ramus. The deep layer arises from the medial surface and inferior margin of the zygomatic arch and attaches to the upper part of the mandibular ramus and the coronoid process. Now, again, ask the patient to clench their jaws and once they've done that, palpate the muscles using circular motion against the underlining structures. Next are the pterygoid muscles. First, we'll begin with the later pterygoid muscle. The attachment of the later pterygoid muscle is as follows. There are two heads for the later pterygoid, the superior head and the inferior head. The superior head arises from the inferior surface of the greater wing and infratemporal crest of siphonoid bone. The inferior head arises from the later surface of the later pterygoid plate. Later pterygoid muscle attaches to the anterior aspects of the neck of the mandible called the pterygoid fovea. To examine the later pterygoid muscle, ask the patient to open the jaw against resistance and to move the jaw while applying gentle resistance. Next is the medial pterygoid muscle. We'll start with the attachment first. The medial pterygoid muscle also have two heads, the deep head and the superficial head. The deep head arises from the medial surface of the later pterygoid plate and adjacent 
pyramidal processes of palatine bone, while the superficial head arises from the tuberosity of maxilla. The medial pterygoid muscle attaches to the medial aspect of the mandibular ramus close to the angle of the mandible. The examination of medial pterygoid is carried out intraorally, lingually to the mandibular ramus. The next examination is the examination of the major salivary glands, namely parotid and submandibular salivary glands. Before that, stand behind the patient and inspect for any obvious asymmetry. While standing behind the patient, start with your examination. Parotid gland comes first. The location of the parotid gland is in front of the ears and it goes all the way down to the mandibular ramus. So use your fingers and palpate the area in front of the ear, more specifically tragus, all the way down to the mandibular ramus. This is done to detect any swelling or pain in this region. Next is the submandibular gland. The submandibular gland is located below the jaw. For the palpation, put your finger on the inferior border of the mandible, more specifically at angle of the mandible and go medially. You will feel a dip there. Now ask the patient to touch the tongue, to touch the roof of the mouth with the tongue and while they done so, start palpating this region for the palpation of the submandibular gland. Normally, the palpation of the glands is painless. However, enlarged glands can be painful or palpation and may indicate acute inflammation or infection. The next examination is the examination of the lymph nodes. For that, stand behind the patient and use both hands. So far, all the examination that has been done is done by using both hands. Now, the lymph nodes are located in various regions. First region is the occipital region. The occipital lymph nodes are located along the hairline. So for that, ask the patient to either tie up their hair, if not, to lift their hair so that the hairline is visible. Once the hairline is visible, use your fingers and palpate in circular motion from inside out the occipital lymph nodes. Next is the submental lymph nodes. Submental lymph nodes are located in the submental region that is below the jaw. Put your finger behind the symphysis in the submental region and in circular motion palpate the submental lymph nodes. Next is the submandibular lymph nodes. The submandibular lymph nodes are located at the inferior border of the mandible. For this, ask the patient to tilt their head on one side. When the patient has tilted their head on one side, examine the side that the patient head is tilted to towards, that is towards the relaxed side. Again, use your fingers to palpate the relaxed side in circular motion for the submandibular lymph nodes. Last is the cervical lymph nodes. Ask the patient to turn their head on one side and then look down. A muscle named sternocleidomastoid muscle pops out. Just to let you know, sternocleidomastoid muscle's attachment is, it originates from the anterior of the manubrium and superior border and anterior surface of the middle, uh, middle third of the clavicle and it inserts at the mastoid process. The sternocleidomastoid muscles have lymph nodes on the anterior border and the posterior border. So you will palpate these areas from top to bottom in circular motion. There are in total 12 cranial nerves and the first cranial nerve is the olfactory cranial nerve. The primary function of this nerve is smell. To assess this nerve, ask the patient to plug their nose on one side and breathe from the other. Likewise, repeat the process on the other side. You can also use some scents like coffee or cinnamon and ask the patient to detect them, but make sure they have their eyes closed so the test is valid. The second cranial nerve is called the optic nerve. 
The primary function of this nerve is vision. To, to assess this nerve, physician uses visual acuity test, most commonly snell chart. The snell chart is placed at a distance of 6 meters from the patient, and the patient is asked to read the alphabets out loud, first by covering one eye, and then the other, and then by reading with both eyes. Another test is called visual fields. In this, the patient covers one of their eyes, and the physician closes one of their eyes as well, but on the same side. Then, the physician raises their arms at an equal distance and moves them upward. Now, the physician raises their fingers of one hand, then the other, then the physician lowers their arms, keeping at an equal distance, and raises their hands of one and then the other. While doing so, they will ask the patient how many fingers did they raise. This will assess the visual fields of the patient. And this should be repeated on the both sides. The next is the pupil response. For this, light is used. Light is placed on the eye of the patient. A direct response is the constriction of the pupil. When the same light is placed on the eye of the patient of the, on the same side, the, an indirect response can also be seen on the other eye. And that response is called consensual response. Again, this should be performed on both the eyes. The third cranial nerve is called the oculomotor nerve. With the third cranial nerve, the fourth cranial nerve, which is the tocular nerve, and the sixth cranial nerve, which is the abducens nerve, can also be examined. The primary function of these three nerves is the movement of the muscles of the eye. To assess these nerves, ask the patient to focus on your finger while the physician is, ma is making an itch with their finger. The fifth cranial nerve is called the trigeminal nerve. It has sensory and motor functions. The sensory function is the sensation to the face. Facial sensation is determined by light response to light touch and or pinprick without drawing blood. It is important to investigate all the areas of the face. The motor function of the fifth cranial nerve is that it supplies to the muscles of mastication, that is masseter, temporalis, later pterygoid, and mediterygoid muscles. To know more details of this, kindly go through the examination of the muscles that has already been discussed. Corneal nerve depends upon the integrity of two nerves. Number one is the fifth cranial nerve, which is the trigeminal nerve, and the other one is the seventh cranial nerve, which is the facial nerve. This is tested by gently touching the cornea with a wisp of a cotton wool. Normally, this procedure causes blinking. The next cranial nerve is the seventh cranial nerve, which is the facial nerve. The primary motor function of this nerve is the supply to the facial muscles. To assess this nerve, ask the patient to close their eyes. If the patient is unable to do so, any palsy may be obvious. Then ask the patient to close their eyes tightly. Once they've done so, the physician may attempt to open the eyes and note the degree of force required to part the eyelids. Then ask the patient to wrinkle their forehead and note if there is any difference between the two sides. Then ask the patient to smile, purse their lips, blow on the cheek and whistle. So far, we've studied seven cranial nerves. The first one is the olfactory nerve. The se second is optic nerve. Third is oculomotor nerve. Fourth is the tocular nerve. Fifth is the trigeminal nerve. Sixth is the abducens nerve. And seventh is the facial nerve. The eighth cranial nerve is the vestibulocochlear nerve. The primary function of this nerve is hearing and balance. To assess the hearing, the physician uses Weber and Rainey test using a tuning fork. To assess the balance, the physician asks the patient to touch their hands with their eyes open once, and then the physician asks the patient to close their eyes, raise their hand up, and then touch the hands of the physician again. Next, we're going to study two nerves together, 
that is the ninth cranial nerve, which is the glossopharyngeal nerve, and the tenth cranial nerve, which is the vagus nerve. Since they both perform the same function, that is gag reflex, we're going to study them together. To assess the gag reflex, touch the back of the mouth of the patient, and upon touching, the patient will show a gag reflex. The ninth cranial nerve also has another function, that is in taste, and it is in the one-third posterior part of the tongue. The 11th cranial nerve is called the accessory nerve. The function of this nerve is that it supplies to sternocleidomastoid muscle and trapezius muscle. To assess this nerve, firstly we'll assess the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Ask the patient to look at one side and resist your push. The sternocleidomastoid muscle will be visible. You can even palpate it. For the trapezius muscle, ask the patient to move their shoulder upwards like in shrugging and ask them to resist your push. The last cranial nerve is called the hypoglossal nerve. It is the 12th cranial nerve. Its primary function, the motor function, is that it supplies to the muscles of the tongue. To assess this nerve, ask the patient to protrude the tongue, that is to take it out, and then ask the patient to move the tongue on either side, that is from one side and then to the other. Lastly, we will examine the limbs. Hands reveal a lot about the patient's condition, so make sure you examine them properly. Check for any rashes, pigmentation, or conditions such as arthritis or Raynaud's phenomena. In Raynaud's phenomena, there is decreased blood flow in the fingers of the hand. Also check the fingers if any finger clubbing is present, which may indicate a systemic disease. Nails should also be observed. Nail changes may indicate anxiety, which is in the form of nail biting, or diseases like colunicia, that is spoon-shaped nails, and iron deficiency. That is all for today's session. I hope it was informative for you. Until next time, stay happy, stay healthy, and study hard with skadia.com.